Um, our minister is here. Um, and I know we wanted to um, end the meeting and do all of that formally, but I know he has a hard stop. So we're actually going to integrate you into the meeting, Minister, if you don't mind. Um, and I will. I know folks will have questions to you, so I'm telling them now. If you have questions for the Minister, he has a hard stop at like 4.50. Um, write them in the chat and someone will get them to me. Um, Minister, given that you have, we have such a short time with you, I'm going to forego your bio. Everyone knows who you are. You are our Okasi's MPP, I'm sorry, MP. I just, um, I, I, I was, I'm not going to say demoted. I, I almost made you a member of a different parliament. Um, Okasi member of parliament for Eglinton Lawrence, Okasi's home writing, Minister, Marco Mendocino, welcome. We look forward to hearing what it is that you have to share with us this evening. Thanks, Debbie. And I would never take an introduction from you as a demotion. If anything, it's a promotion. So um, <laughs> Charming. <laughs> it's always, always good to be with you. I think this is the second time this week, and uh, some of you may have been on our other call, but uh, I felt very strongly about attending your AGM, Debbie, because of our personal relationship, but also because of the work that you do. And so I'll begin by saying, as I always do, a big thank you on behalf of myself, the department, and everybody in government uh, for all the work that, that you've been doing, not only during COVID, but for, for many, many years now. And look, uh, the more that I have conversations with people, the more I think we all recognize that this year has really been indescribably difficult and challenging, and that the only way we're going to see ourselves through is if we continue to stay connected and to share our experiences and our bonds. And I think this is one of the truly resilient hallmarks of being Canadian, that we do look out for one another, that we do care uh, for each other. And that is how we're gonna pull through this. And so immigration has a fundamental role to play in all of that, as you know. Um, you know, I was just uh, listening uh, in on, 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 the, uh, on the remarks and uh, you know, I was hearing about the, the 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 change in 2015, and it seems like it's an eternity ago uh, now, almost five years ago. Um, sorry, more than five years ago, uh, just uh, in the last 10 days, come to think of it. And, um, you know, we have made a lot of progress on immigration, and we are continuing to grow uh, when it comes to economic immigration and families and our work in the humanitarian space. But that has been challenged by this pandemic. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that, that uh, when we had to put in place the travel restrictions, that that really did impede the flow of people across international borders. And while we have found workarounds and created new innovative ways to see that that flow continues, um, it, we are still a long way from being back to normal times. And I think that the reality is, is that while no one has any crystal ball, um, we are still probably some months away, if not perhaps more, before we go back to a travel restriction free um, era at the border. And so I just think that that puts us in the right mind frame uh, for how we're gonna have to continue to collaborate, uh, to be creative, to ensure that we can continue to grow uh, um, through immigration. Um, I will say, that on the bright side, that um, that we we are still landing uh, immigrants. Uh, you know, it'll come as no shock that we're not going to hit our 2020 targets. We'd initially said 341,000. I still remember tabling that plan, and uh, at the time, I think it was the largest number, certainly in the modern era. Maybe you'd have to go back to the beginning of the 20th century to see a number higher than that. And then, you know, having to uh, really effectively shut the door at the border. Notwithstanding that, we are still finding ways to get some landings, and that's super important. And we are also reuniting families. You know, one of the things that really appealed to to my sense of compassion, and I'm sure yours as well, were the many, many stories that we we saw in the news online about people being separated by those restrictions. And so that was a real motivation to see if there weren't ways to to expand the definition of dem, uh, of families to include unmarried couples, to include people beyond that core uh, group of the family uh, relatives, and that it's working, that we are starting to see more people come together. And that's really important to me. 
And I think going forward, making sure that we've got the resources at the border, the health protocols, the quarantining uh, protocols, all of which are imperative. They're essential in order to continue to manage the risks of COVID-19, which we are not out of the woods of yet. I mean, I don't know if you saw that Ontario reported about 900 cases today. I mean, that is just a really stark reminder that, that as much as we want to continue to uh, see people cross those borders and come to Canada, that we, we we can't just flip the switch back right open. And so in order to guard against those risks, the protocols that we put in place are going a long way towards allowing us to keep that lifeline uh, uh, coming into Canada. Now, I'll say something about tomorrow. Uh, and tomorrow is an important day because uh, within the next 19, maybe 18 and a half hours, 17 and a half hours or so, um, we are going to be tabling our uh, immigration plan for 2021 to 2023. I'm very excited about this. Uh, I have been saying since I became minister that the way that we are going to continue to grow as a country is through immigration. And I think that the data is unassailable on that front. When you look at our workforce, when you look at how quickly we're aging, when you look at declining birth rates, there's a perfect storm of variables which have really um, uh, required us and compelled us to look at immigration. And it is the success of that policy, having, having an open country, an inclusive country, a country that believes in diversity, uh, that, that sees diversity as a strength, that sees people coming together from different parts of the world to share their perspectives, their culture and their identity is one of the reasons why we're so economically competitive. And so I look forward to talking about that. And, you know, I think because of that and because I feel so passionately about it and because I think that the evidence supports it, that my, my hope is that you will be right there with me making the case for ongoing growth in immigration economically uh, from a family perspective, and equally, uh, if not increasingly, when it comes to our work in the humanitarian space. Uh, because we've seen some countries who we have been historically uh, partnered with uh, take some decisions around their policies and refugees. And it's and what's happened is, is that our partners at the UNHCR and the IOM and others are appealing to us and they're saying, we need Canada to continue to, to be there. And my commitment to them and to you is that we will be there, that we will continue to play a leading role on the world stage when it comes to resettling refugees. And we certainly can't do it without the generosity of the Canadian people. And that is something that I have tremendous faith in. Um, I think going forward, you know, we, we had a talk earlier this week, Debbie, around settlement services and the mandate and the funding and the resources. And I know you're all completely strapped. And I know that you are stretching yourselves to the absolute limit, finding new ways to connect and to provide that frontline service to uh, our, our, new our new arrivals, our aspiring Canadians. Um, I'm going to continue to champion the work that you do. Um, I think that the plan that I'm going to table tomorrow will, by necessity, require more support for you. And that is going to be a good piece of news that I hope that you will be able to also share and amplify. And by looking at the support that we provide to our settlement service providers, including Okazi, um, we're going to be able to start the integration process you know, long before they get here, whether it's online and then once they are here, finding ways to provide additional language support and orientation support and training and skills so that they can really hit the ground running. And as I say, we cannot do it without you. So, you know, I want to keep my remarks brief. I, I always like to have a bit of a conversation more than read from a script. I know that that sometimes makes my staff a little bit anxious, but always afterwards, it seems to go okay. And, uh, and so with that, I'll just say thank you very much, Debbie, for the opportunity to address you and uh, your members uh, at the AGM. Thank you for all the work that you do. And please do stay tuned for tomorrow. And please share that news as widely and as broadly as you can and emphasize our partnership and the strength of immigration going forward. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Merci beaucoup, Minister. Um, there are questions coming in. Um, folks, uh, write your questions and they'll get to me. The first question is from one of our um, colleagues um, working in the women's sector. Um, she says that um, while, although we bring in skilled immigrants, many are being pushed to work in p the precarious labor market. Um, their skills are getting the devalued. There is mass unemployment. Um, it's the root of growing Im immigrant um, poverty. 
what is your plan to address the increasing unemployment or the mass unemployment, as she calls it, to support immigrants to get skills connected to their jobs? Well, that's a great question. And certainly with unemployment being higher as a result of COVID, it's one that I think that we have to confront together. And um, what I think we can learn uh, from the lessons of history going forward is that when we grow through immigration, we actually grow our economy. And the reason for that is that when you, when you look at our economy, you will see that there are some very acute uh, shortages, labor shortages, in some of our most essential parts uh, of the workforce. So whether that's in health or whether that's in trades, in building, or whether that's increasingly in the tech sector, which is booming, there are always demands and pressures to find the skills and the experience that are necessary to fill those jobs. And the reality is, is that we can benefit by bringing those immigrants who possess those skills uh, and aligning them into the vacancies that are uh, there in the community. And that's where I think Okazi can be a, a real conduit and a real partner by sharing the, the information that you're getting, the feedback that you're getting uh, from our newcomers, as well as from our partners uh, right across the community and the business sector. We can, I think, do better, if I'm gonna be honest with you, in seeing that alignment and seeing that integration um, occur more, more expeditiously. And so I, I think that that is, that is going to be one of the bedrock of, bedrocks of, of the case that we're gonna make tomorrow when we, when we talk about this plan, that there are acute labor shortages that exist in some of the most important parts of our economy and that the way we're gonna meet those shortages is by you know, uh, welcoming uh, new Canadians. Thank you for that. Um, you know, you can't come to the to Ocasio without a question around regularization. And so every call, I think every conversation that you and I have had since you've become minister has been around regularization. Yeah. So, minister, um, we've seen some of the um, projects that you've come forward with. You talked about there's a small um, project around agricultural farm workers. There is another one around health workers that we think should be expanded. Uh, is there a plan for just a broad regularization project here in Canada? If now, if not now, then when? And when? Well, I, I think that that is um, a really important and timely reflection, Debbie. And I, I want to thank you for your advocacy. And obviously, you know, I've been engaged with, with many groups right across the country, including the Mig Migrant Workers mm -hmm. Alliance, who are, are, are really bringing this issue to the fore, and rightfully so. Uh, and in particular in the agricultural sector where, you know, through the seasonal agricultural worker program, we've got approximately 60,000 workers who come from all over, but particularly uh, Central and South America. And the conditions are challenging. And I just want to say that it is not lost on me or my colleagues in government that when we invite workers, that they are entitled to every bit the same protection and rights as Canadian workers are. Um, Canada has a good reputation for its immigration policies and in welcoming people, but in order to protect that reputation, those rights have to be there. And yes, that does intersect with status. Um, I accept that as well. Uh, and I do think that we are at a, at, a, at a juncture right now where we do have to talk about um, how we can potentially broaden those op opportunities, not only in the food sector, but I think right across the many different sectors where we have temporary workers who are filling those gaps. And I'll come back to the health example, uh, but also, you know, in the trades. I, I mean, I often hear from the labor uh, leadership that that, you know, they too would like to see more skills and experience brought in. And so when you pause for a moment and you take inventory and stock of where we are at, which is still very much in a world where borders are very restricted, um, do we now have a, have a chance to look at the uh, talent and the experience and the skill set that is already within Canada and say to ourselves that these are the ones who are rolling up their sleeves, who are contributing? And as Canadians, should we not recognize that? Can we not recognize that and broaden and, and broaden that path, uh, broaden that road that they can walk that and make that journey perhaps a little bit faster towards permanent residency? I think that there is. Uh, I'm looking forward to having that debate. I think that there will be a very lively debate about that, that there may be some cynics, there may be some skeptics uh, who will say, for instance, that simply by granting status, uh, to, to workers that you don't actually address the structural challenges within those sectors where we see perhaps not as competitive or a livable wage. 
And I do think that there is some merit to that. We also have to recognize that, you know, if you give people status, uh, that there is the chance, there is the risk that they then move on from that job. By the way, I am not opposed to that uh, because part of the, 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 the promise that Canada offers is upward mobility. And so if you come in through the front door and you work hard at a job um, and we give you a way to achieve permanent residency status, I think that, that part of that bargain is that if, if you have the uh, desire and the ambition to, to, to move on to do other work, then you should have that freedom. Um, and that doesn't necessarily address the challenge in that particular sector. So we've got to navigate that. We've got to have that discussion. But as far as making sure that people have the rights and the protections, uh, regardless of the sector that they work in, I am uh, fully subscribed to that view. I know my colleague, Minister Qualtro is as well, uh, as part of uh, her responsibilities in administering the LMIA uh, process, as well as uh, Minister Bibo. The three of us are very, very focused on this issue, I assure you. That's good to know. And so we will include um, those two ministers in our advocacy work um, as well. Um, our sense is that Canadians are open um, to this at this point, as they've seen the contributions that folks who are here with precarious and so, and those who are undocumented have contributed um, during this period of the emergency. Um, and my sense is if we miss this opportunity, um, there we, we will never have another time like this when Canadians are so open to embracing um, migrants um, who are already here. Um, are you planning or is there any conversations about the situation in Hong Kong? Will you be creating a program specific to folks from Hong Kong wanting to migrate here because of uh, security issues? Well, you know, th th this question has come up and, mm -hmm. and I have expressed repeatedly, as as the Prime Minister, uh, we are extremely concerned about the passage of the national security law by the PRC in Hong Kong, which has led to the arbitrary detention and arrest of a number of individuals who are simply expressing uh, their right uh, to, uh, to preserve a democratic life in Hong Kong to the extent that it still exists at all. And so uh, we want to say, certainly first and foremost to the Canadians, the some 300,000 or so Canadians who live in Hong Kong, um, you always are welcome home. I mean, that is a fundamental right as a citizen. Uh, but to those you know, who are perhaps reflecting on whether or not Hong Kong will continue to offer that democratic life going forward, I, I do think that there are ways in which we can condemn the PRC's uh, legislation, for example, by suspending our extradition treaty with Hong Kong, uh, by limiting the movement of goods between Canada and that region, and by you know also keeping an open door to looking at immigration options, something that I am laser-like focused on, something the PM has mentioned in the past. And I think that we, we have an obligation to really keep all options on the table. And that obviously includes uh, defending human rights all over the world. And so that's what you can count on from me. Um, service el eligibility is an ongoing conversation. Given the, um, that um, the Temporary Foreign Workers Program, International Students Program is a pathway to permanent residence often, um, will you open up eligibility of, of IRCC funded services to these two groups? Well, certainly, uh, let me just talk for a moment about uh, students and then we can come back to the other. But um, the students was recently revived uh, on October 20th. We have now a pathway. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we didn't just, um, again, simply hit go on that particular initiative is that international students are members of a vulnerable population. Uh, many of them who come to Canada don't speak the language or not as fluent, uh, are not familiar with their communities, um, are not, um, you know, familiar even with their campuses. And so we had to be sure that there were supports in place for that group, in addition to making sure that the schools and the institutions who are certified by the provinces have COVID ready plans to welcome that particular class of immigrant. And so that takes time, that takes due, uh, due diligence. And we feel confident now that with those discussions having been had and a clear understanding of the role that the provinces have to play in regulating the day-to-day -day administration of the educational sector, that as they approve schools, 
and designate them as learning institutions that we can then welcome that cohort back. And that certainly will mean that um, that we will see, I think, some prioritization of the processing of the paper that will um, allow and enable students to come and take their education here in Canada. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't still have on the table uh, some of the modifications to our policies that have created some flexibility during COVID. And by that, I mean, um, where appropriate, loosening uh, work permit restrictions for those international students who work in essential services like health, as well as um, really offering as much uh, of an online educational experience as possible. And that is something that, you know, I just got briefed on yesterday by 17 of the Polytech uh, institutions across Canada. And, you know, Seneca had this really interesting um, uh, orientation where they called it uh, Senecan Welcome. And so even before our students get to Canada, they are able to take a tour and orient themselves around the various campuses. Those are the types of innovations that I think that we need to really um, engender with our policies, with our flexibility, so that uh, if they're, as long as there are travel restrictions in place, that at least they can start their classes online, start to get familiar with the Canadian experience, and then once they get here, uh, really start to integrate uh, as quickly as possible. Great. Um, and I'm going to combine these two next questions. Um, are you considering making permanent the rural and northern immigration pilot and any updates on the municipal um, nominee program? So on the rural and northern immigration pilot, we are now at the next stage of that. We have 11 towns um, selected from all over uh, the country. And I'm very excited. In fact, I was just on the phone today with my provincial counterpart, in Manitoba, where they have not one but two communities there. And um, the next step will be starting to uh, use the allocated spaces to identify their candidates. And as time goes on, we are really, really going to watch to see whether or not we can replicate the success that we enjoyed with the Atlantic immigration pilot. It seems to me that the more that those pilots partner with local businesses and chambers, uh, and the more that we get a real-time sense of where the gaps are in smaller and regional communities, um, including in the north, then the more likely we will see a replication of that success. So I'm hopeful that uh, in time that there will be a conversation had about do we want to keep some of these uh, pilots which are, are whose objective is to distribute immigration across the country and to move away from some of that hyper concentration of immigration to large city centers uh, as a part of our permanent architecture. We already made that commitment with the AIP. Um, we are in the midst of making it permanent. I think that, uh, that there is the possibility that we might see that uh, replicated with, uh, with the rural and northern immigration pilot. And on the municipal nominee, uh, nominee program, um, which was part of our campaign platform in the last election, um, I have begun uh, consultations with our PT partners and with our settlement service providers. We have now taken that input as a first pass and we are moving to the next stage of the rollout of that program by weaving it into um, uh, uh, basically uh, an intake process which will allow people to express interest and then I think the next stage will be to then choose from those communities who would like to participate in the MNP um, a way in which they can start to, uh, to to apply it and implement it. So all good work that is going forward on both fronts. Thank you. Um, this is a question about employment equity. Every research, um, including StatsCan, um, the, our session, plenary session before our annual general meeting was on the she recovery and the impact of COVID and women. Um, even StatsCan was showing that racialized and immigrant and refugee women, um, indigenous folks, uh, folks with disability, but primarily um, women have been hardest hit economically um, by, by the pandemic um, and the economic downturn. Um, are there any plans to attach conditions of employment equity to the billions of dollars going out in infrastructure projects? I and 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 how do we get that on the agenda of your cabinet? Well, one way is for me to take that feedback to my colleague, Minister McKenna, who is a huge uh, advocate for uh, not only women in politics, but women writ large. And so I, I think you could take it 
as a as 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 a given that that she would be very intrigued by this idea. And as you point out, I mean, there are real challenges uh, for women to get gainful employment, get back to work. Something that we're all very attentive to. And by the way, something that I think uh, immigration can support. But before I come to that. You know, we've often talked about the policies of this government, uh, which is a progressive government, which want, which believes that, um, you know, a strong economy means that every single person, women, young girls, racialized communities, people of color should be able to fully participate in and also get, you know, the same wage for the same work. I mean, those are principles that you are seeing advanced by this government. Are we there yet? No, we're not. But we, we, we do believe, I think, in, in advancing those objectives by, for instance, continuing to up the support under the Canada Child Benefit Plan, particularly during COVID, particularly while uh, some women remain, many women, unfortunately, remain unemployed. And so that is something that will help. But in addition to that, at the IRCC level, our plans are always subjected to the GBA plus analysis. So we actually look for these systemic barriers. We look for these gaps and we want to be sure that we are closing them to the extent possible. And that means having um, an immigration framework that promotes diversity, that promotes opportunity for women to align women who may be coming from abroad or who are already here into those vacancies in the parts of the economy where we need them the most. And so that, you know, again, is, is work that will go on in concert with your advocacy. And I will happily share the idea that you put to me around infrastructure with Minister McKenna. And I would not at all be surprised to see her say that she's supportive. Yeah, but just to clarify, um, because we know that from employment equity, white women have benefited the most. Um, so we're looking at racialized um, women. Um, we're looking at indigenous peoples. We're looking at people with this and having those conditions attached to transfer payments to provinces, but also to the private sector, that they that they that they must be conditions attached, that they are hiring um, folks who are being most uh, made vulnerable and made most marginalized by by the pandemic and and this um, economic downturn. I hear you loud and clear on that, and I agree. And um, you know, I absolutely will be happy to share and advocate for that. Lots of questions around the regularization status. Um, lots of questions around access to um, services. Um, what, I, the other follow-up, you talked about um, the child tax benefit as a way of ensuring women's economic, uh, I, I don't know, the, the word escapes me, and I only speak English, so when I lose it, I don't have another language. Um, but one of our biggest concern is that we have very many mixed citizen families. So we have Canadian children with parents who are undocumented. Unfortunately, they're not able to access the child benefit, the, the Canadian child benefit, which I still believe is one of the best policy tools that we have in this country. How do we ensure that all Canadian children, regardless of the immigration status of their parents, are able to access CCB? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, by removing any discrepancies in the eligibility uh, for those programs that uh, differentiate on, on status. And so you may recall that that came up in the context of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And we were sure that those benefits would extend to people regardless of immigration status, as long as they met all of the other essential criteria. Um, I think going forward, we need to really also look at other ways to support um, newcomers and in particular those members of vulnerable populations, racialized communities. Uh, and here again, I think the work that Minister Hussein uh, is doing on this front is critically important. Um, I know that Minister Ng and, and uh, the Prime Minister recently introduced uh, the Black Entrepreneurialism uh, Loan Fund, something that I neglected to mention in the last uh, a, a question and round. But, uh, you know, I just had a round table with a number of Black business leaders in my community on Eglinton West. I don't know, some of you may be familiar, but there is still a very cherished pocket group of those business leaders who are looking for supports. And so that will be an opportunity there. And I think in terms of, you know, IRCC, um, we are here to, I think, facilitate opportunities for those who want to come to Canada, who want to integrate, and I think in partnership with OCASI, providing you with the support that you need uh, so that you can essentially parlay that into additional language and skills and experience training, uh, that, that, that they are set up for success. And this is why tomorrow, uh, when we announce our plan, I think by extension, you will see that support there. And it's it's I'm, I'm excited about it. I think, 
you know, when, when we grow through immigration, I think that we will see those opportunities for all of these groups come into play far more than we have in the past. There are questions around credentialing, Minister, and what role IRCC can play in making it uh, the process easier for immigrants so that they're able to work in their field. Um, but there was also a question about having deaf newcomers on on immigration's radar. Um, the, the person says, I wish to have deaf newcomers on your radar as the barriers they face once they arrive in Canada continue to exist, especially um, with citizenship. Um, one of our member organizations, Silent Voice, does incredible work with newcomers who are, de- who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, we were successful in having some changes made to the citizenship um, process uh, in terms of them being able to access citizenship. Still a lot of work to do there, but certainly something that we're hoping that your, your shop um, will continue to pay attention to in terms of how it is that we go about integrating um, deaf newcomers to, to Canada. Um, again, um, will you advocate for the inclusion of international students and temporary foreign workers in some of the income support programs like the CRB? Yes, and, and as I said earlier, we I, I've already um, advocated and will continue to advocate that there are as few barriers as possible to provide supports for newcomers, uh, including disabled uh, newcomers. Um, I'll just say that I have worked very closely with Minister Qualtro. Um, to be sure that our processes are inclusive of, of, of members of the disabled community. Just to give you one concrete example, you may recall, not this year, but last year when we launched the parent and grandparent program, that there were some barriers to enabling uh, disabled members from expressing interest in that. We've reduced those barriers in that program. In addition to that, I know that Minister Qualtro has um, introduced um, a benefit, which we'll see disabled people continue to get support, uh, more support throughout COVID. And when we get feedback, like the point that you made just around those uh, who have disabilities, we want to take that feedback and make our, our, our programs and our policies as inclusive as possible. And that means reducing barriers. So without question, uh, we appreciate that feedback. And it just comes back to that central principle that, you know, in order for an economy to be successful, we need to really be addressing uh, the, the structural and the systemic barriers which have held uh, many, many groups back. And these are well-defined groups. You know, Minister Chagger, uh, who is the minister responsible for diversity, inclusion, and youth, and I have held a number of roundtables in my community where we take that feedback very seriously. And one of the things that I think that we can do better at is gather data and make the best sense of it and really see you know, where we're making progress. And one of the things that I've heard um, repeatedly is, if you can't measure it, then you don't really know whether or not you're succeeding at it and making progress. Absolutely. So, so you know, that, is a, that is a consistent theme that we're trying to apply at IRCC as well. Good. Lots more questions, but I know Chris is yelling at me that you have to go. You're already five minutes late for yelling your last at meeting. You. You <laughs> you, you know, you, yeah. Chris will never do that. Um, but there is one last question that I really need you to comment on. It's around caregivers who fall short of the 24 months mark um, of work experience, especially the ones who are survivors of violence. Um, what do we what what do we say? How do we support caregivers so that they're able to transition to permanent residency? Well, first, by making sure that they that that the path is is there and that it's broad enough. And caregivers is one of those identifiable groups that are going to play a critical role in our response to COVID nineteen. Um, and that was true before the pandemic hit, but I think it will be even more true going forward. With a retiring and an aging population like the one that we have, um, we need caregivers, and this is one of those uh, stubbornly rigid areas uh, to recruit domestic labor for. So. Uh, there will be, uh, I think, an ongoing program to have uh, caregivers come to Canada, but they also need to uh, get the additional support and protections that are uh, necessary for that kind of challenging work. And I'll just say that the current iteration of the program does not require caregivers to live with their employers and let, they, they can choose to, but it does not require them to because there were reports under that the, in that era that there were some relationships that did not work. So having that kind of flexibility, having the kind of access to the uh, COVID era related supports that are there to provide that cushion uh, around, having access to affordable housing, 
access to healthcare, the suite of supports that need to be in place in order to set them up for success, including pathways to permanent residency, will be part of our, our strategy. Thank you so much. And with that, I will let you go. Thank you for joining us. Do you want to keep going? We can keep going. Uh, It's always so good to be with you, Debbie. Thank you very much. Um, And thank you all uh, for joining the call and for all of your work. We really do appreciate it. And uh, please, tomorrow, all I would ask is, um, you know, this work is vocational. I know how much you believe in it. It's not always an easy subject to navigate. When we talk about immigration, you know, it's it's one of those subjects where I think we're all very proud. We all can relate to it. But in order to keep it, um, you know, in that space, we really have to stick together. And so when we launch that plan tomorrow, I hope that you will see your work reflected in it. And more importantly, that you will see uh, an optimistic future uh, charted ahead. So uh, on that happy note, I'll just say thank you again, Debbie, and look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you, Marco. Always good to have you. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.